By creating opportunities for the community to get involved, our next group is working hard to replenish plant species and save the Otago skink at the same time. Here is the Central Otago Ecological Trust. <laughs> That's our Mayor and I've been trying to rein him in all weekend and I just hope. So, um, kia ora koutou. Hi everybody. My name's Grant Norbury, I'm the Chair of the Central Otago Ecological Trust and it's a pleasure to introduce Tom Lamb, a trustee, and Tony Lepper, the Mayor of the Central Otago District Council. We're passionate about, you may have already gathered talking to some of us, we're passionate about restoring native species and ecosystems in Central Otago, many of which have now gone. And native lizards once flourished in our warm, sunny climate, particularly this species, the beautiful Otago skink. It's now extinct from our local area, and we want to bring them back. They're big suckers. They're not the little guys that you're probably more used to seeing. They grow up to about a foot long, actually. And they've got these beautiful golden marks along their body, which is a great Central Otago icon. They're charismatic, or we think so. To call them cute might be pushing it slightly, but we still think they're quite cute. Yeah. But it soon dawned on us that even though we we're talking about wildlife conservation, that's as much about people as it is about nature. And that's the focus of our talk today. Our vision is to create a pest-free dryland sanctuary, to reintroduce fauna and flora to the Alexandra Basin where it's become lost, and to educate the Central Otago community about dryland ecosystems. What have we done so far? We formed a trust, uh, people with wide-ranging skills uh, became part of the trust. We, we created a lizard breeding facility. A local company, Breen Construction, quickly donated the time and materials needed for that. Our aim was to have a cage close to town where they could all be seen readily and monitored. We've learned heaps from having these three fellows close by, under the nose of the scientist here. Um, we spent quite a lot of time choosing a really good site that was suitable for a reintroduction of these lizards back into our basin. Uh, we raised up to about $170,000. We built this specialised predator-proof fence. We eradicated the predators inside, and we call this the Moko Moko Dryland Sanctuary. It took us about four years to get to this stage. We reintroduced 28 Otago skinks into the wild for the first time back into our basin since they went locally extinct about 40 to 50 years ago. So it was just such a great event to do that. Uh, there's been good survival of the lizards and they've even produced some babies, which is really cool. We're happy about that. We've established a live display of skinks at our local museum. Weekly fe feeding sessions are a popular attraction. There's only been one finger lost the day. <laughs> the Trust has been recognised as a winner with the 2010 Conservation Award and the Trust Power Awards in 2010 and 2012. The Trust prides itself on the effective utilisation of resources. We do not launch into large and expensive fences. We first tested whether we could establish a small population of skinks trialling and testing materials. Always trying to reduce costs and ensuring the long-term viability of the project. We're a very Scottish lot down south. Too right, too right. Partnerships are an effective way of utilising resources. The skink emblem outside the museum is a major achievement in a community that historically celebrates introduced species like rabbits or the weed thyme. We've got a really good partnership with the Department of Conservation and here we are meeting in the field the other day where we're nutting out a formal agreement for the next five years of our project where we're going to build a bigger fence and introduce a variety of other lizard species back into our basin. The other good partnership we've got is with Landcare Research. They're a Crown Research Institute. They provide us with an office, a phone, computer, and general science support. These partnerships take a long time to develop, but they are a very effective way of spreading resource utilisation. So we're quite proud of that. Um, we're really proud of the impact we've had on the community, but I must say it's come as an unexpected but very pleasant surprise. One thing that, we're, that we often get asked to do is to give public talks, and we've given over 20 over the years to a variety of groups. It's a bit hard to read those, but it's a quite, a, quite a broad range from schools all the way through to um, uh, community groups of various sorts. The thing is, we're not trying to boast here. 
It's just a show of the hunger and, and need for the sort of uh, work that we do. Field days. We have hosted 24 field, field days for the general public, 20 visits from schools, scouts and other interest groups. Everyone wants to come back, and many do. Field days are a great opportunity for hands-on explanation of conservation education in the dryland areas, unique. Social interaction, our field days bring regularly people from the wider Otago region. And it's jolly hard work, clambering around rocks and cutting out these thorny beasts. And here, Tony, I think you can handle that better than I can. You're always into... Thank you, Tom. Yep, yep. <laughs> Discussions over lunch are robust. And similar to this weekend, I have been enriched by the people I've met, by the information I've gained, and the lifestyle balance it provides. The Alexandra Blossom Festival is iconic and it was a big deal when our skink, skink made its first appearance at the festival. Here is something we did not expect. Our skink has been an inspiration to artists, sculptures, authors, and the skink image even made a brief appearance on this rental van. Unfortunately, while the average life of the skink is 15 years, this van lasted only a few weeks before a tourist crashed them. <laughs> <laughs> volunteers. To date, we've had 85 volunteers spending in excess of 5,000 hours on the project. The predator-proof fence requires constant, will, constant, will need constant monitoring. Clearing briar, wild pea and bush lawyer is demanding. Volunteers enjoying being, enjoy being here and you can see by the, the faces, on the, the smiles on their faces that they're, they're really happy to be there. But we took this photograph right at the beginning of the day. <laughs> Not so young. Yeah, there are some very fit, strong, willing and committed senior people that are supporting the work. And you can see this 93-year-old man, John Turnbull. He's just leading a team of, of people down the steep ravine there and um, asked recently why he was so committed to conservation. He said, because it is our duty. Our work inspires kids of all ages. They learn all sorts of interesting things about their local ecology and the little quirks of nature, like the native melocytis berries that grow on the inside of the bush, away from birds, but handy for our skinks to feast on. At the end of the day, the kids come away with a hands-on experience, but still acting like kids. Mm. Like most things that happened at the Trust, our fantastic website has been done entirely by volunteers. Oh, but it hasn't all been plain sailing, I can tell you. We've had to show a lot of initiative and creativity. I'll show you some examples. This is the standard lizard. This is our display area for showing the public our lizards. This is the standard cage design in New Zealand. Well, our, what didn't suit us at all because quite a few of our lizards froze to death because of our central Otago climate. So we had to make these special elaborate piping system that went deep into the ground that the lizards could access and no problems whatsoever. It stays at about three degrees plus below ground. The other problem we've got is very expensive predator-proof fences. They cost up to about $350 a metre, um, but our volunteers designed a much cheaper version of fence. It's about half that price, and some community groups are actually taking this up, which is really, really cool. The other problem we had was we had mice getting into our fenced area. We always thought mice were a fairly benign little beast, but in fact we, had two, we were hosting two Dutch students. They were doing a lot of observations, they found mice attacking this guy and leaving um, bite marks. We had to develop a special poisoning system that was elevated, that lizards couldn't get into, but mice did, and we dealt with the problem that way. So what are some of the lessons we've learnt that's made us successful? Well, the key lesson is he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is people, it is people, yeah. it is people. Unless you have opportunities for people, you're just not going to succeed. And then lesson number two, Ooh. lesson number... <laughs> Two. Okay. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, lesson number two was uh, don't let passion override a methodical and measured approach. We think that's very important for technical projects, especially species conservation. Lesson number three was try to enjoy paperwork. Lesson number four, never give up. That yeah. is the most important. Well Thanks Thank for you. listening, everybody. Thank you, Trust Power.